Hello from the East Coast to the West Coast and to listeners around the world. Welcome to the Truth Seekers Radio Show. I'm your host, Angeline Marie. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. We're broadcasting on Liberty Works Radio Network at libertyworksradionetwork.com and their affiliate stations. Also, don't forget, you can always learn more about our show and find podcasts posted at truthseekersradioshow.com. Today, my guest, once again, is Christopher Johnson. He's the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, and we're going to discuss Christmas. Is it really a Christian holy day? We're going to have our discussion around an article he published called Christmas, the Rejection of Jesus. And if you'll help me, welcome Christopher Johnson. How are you doing, Christopher? Oh, great. Thanks for having me again. I really appreciate it. So, Chris, um, last time we spoke about Halloween. Now, this time, it's about that time of year again, Christmas. So how I wanted to start was, you know, so many Christians today, they kind of, I, I guess some don't, but I would say some Christians do know that Christmas has pagan roots. However, they say, well, you know, we don't celebrate it that way. We celebrate Christmas with the intent of celebrating Christ's birth. So my qu- first question is, in your mind, is there anything wrong with that view? Well, when people, that's that's a typical thing, which you just mentioned that people do. They'll talk about, well, that's not what I intend, but I'm not arguing anyone's intention. And I frustrate people sometimes because if the intentions, you know, the road to hell is paved with those things. We've got plenty of them. And if we judged right and wrong by what people intended, then no one would ever be convicted of a crime ever because everybody's intentions are perfect. So what we've got to focus on is what is right and wrong by God's Word. And God's Word tells us that idolatry and paganism is wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Nothing has changed. God hates paganism and he hates idols. He hates the concept of false gods. And that's what Christmas actually represents in a nutshell, despite what Kirk Cameron may want to tell people. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, lately, well, in the last few, I don't know, at least a couple decades that I can recall is... Christians are fighting for, you know, how how there's this thing between you shouldn't say Merry Christmas, but Happy Holidays is the politically correct way to um, tell someone to have a Merry Christmas without saying Merry Christmas. Can you talk about the literal translation? What really does Merry Christmas mean? Well, yeah, you're right. A lot of people are saying, well, you should say one thing or another, and it's all about sort of the PC stuff. But the fact is that Christmas, obviously, is talking about Christ Mass. That's what it's, you know, consisted of two words. And most people are familiar with this. But the Mass is a Eucharistic service, okay? And this is, I mean, the first thing we'd have to even address is that this is totally Catholic. And I'll get to the, the point of that in just a moment. But uh, in the original meaning, it comes from a word called, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it in Latin, but it's like messe or, or misa or something like that. But it literally means dismissal. So the Catholic, I mean, the Catholic, I understand what the Catholic interpretation that they're going to say that means, oh, we're dismissing people to go out in the world and represent Jesus. But the literal meaning of it is dismissal of Christ. That's what mass of Christ means. So whatever somebody wants to put their intention of what they want it to mean on there, it's literal meaning when they say Merry Christmas is Pete. Because the word dismiss means to discharge or remove or put aside or reject. So it literally means happiness in your rejecting Christ. That's what that word, that phrase means. And of course, you know, like I said, I know what Catholics are going to argue on that. But the fact of the matter is that the Eucharist, which is what that whole thing represents, is the the rejection of denial of the Lord Jesus Christ, where they attempt to drink his blood, which isn't actually his blood, but they believe it is through the false miracles and transubstantiation. And we have an entire, I mean, that gets into the Catholic issue. We got a whole expose on the Catholic Church on our website. If you just type in the word Catholic at creationliberty.com, you can get more information on that. But they, they have these false miracles in transubstantiation, you know, where they say, oh, we're going to make the, we're going to turn the wine into blood. But it still appears to be wine. But trust us, it's the blood of Christ, which would be like Jesus Christ coming and say, hey, guys, I resurrected Lazarus. I know he looks dead, he stinks, and he's wrapped in clothes and he's not moving. But trust me, he's alive. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the kind of false miracles they do. Anyway, so, and, and of course, the New Testament says, you know, we're, we're supposed to abstain from blood. Uh, we're not supposed to be consuming blood in anywhere, in either in the Old or New Testament at all. But they do this anyway, and they believe that the Eucharist is a blood sacrifice that they must pay over and over 
to have their sins forgiven. They say the perpetual sacrifice for the remission of sins, that is directly from their Catholic catechism. And I encourage people to go look that up. So what they're doing in the Mass is denying Jesus Christ. They're rejecting Christ through that, and they're teaching a workspace doctrine, false doctrine that's leading millions of people to hell. So that's why I'm, I'm saying it doesn't even matter what they, well, I want to attend, or I want to go into, like, well, maybe this, if you look at it in a German way, it might mean this, or something. I've read lots of different explanations they try to give onto it. The fact of the matter is that the Eucharist is a rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his doctrines. And the, the phrase itself literally means happiness to your rejecting Christ. So what I try to explain to people is that we shouldn't have anything to do with the worldly stuff at all anyway, especially not with the Catholic stuff that's yoking up with the world and teaching false doctrine and that kind of thing. So in Galatians chapter 4, where it teaches us, and well, you know, starting in verse 9, it says, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Well, what's he referring to when he says weak and beggarly elements and the desire to be in bondage? He said, he continues and says, ye observe days and months and times and years. Our observance of times, like the heathen do, talk about in Jeremiah chapter 10, which we'll discuss later, is uh, that whole thing is ne- was not to be done in the Old Testament, nor in the New Testament. People think that the New Testament, oh, just because, you know, it's labeled with the word Jesus, therefore it's okay. Well, just like when we talked about in the Halloween article, I, you know, we covered all that, what we teach on that. The Christmas is the same thing, and I gave the example. You know, if you have a satanic altar and you, you stick a slap a, you know, I heart Jesus bumper sticker on it, does mm-hmm. that make the satanic altar good just because you, you slap the Lord Jesus onto it? Well, obviously not, and born-again Christians can understand that very clearly, but yet they will turn around and make excuses when it comes to Christmas, which is a total contradiction. I agree, and, you know, it, I was thinking about this, too, and I, I'm, I think it's because one of the reasons. Well, you know, they, they've been, they've grown up just celebrating Christmas. But I think the other side is too. Even when you get older, it's like the time of year that family finally stops everything and gets together and spends time together. And yeah. I think that also may have a lot to do with it. Oh, and you're not kidding because a lot of people, all they do is they attach their emotions to this holiday. See, it's not the the arguments that people are making, at least from my experience, when I've, I've talked to numerous people about this issue. I mean, we have lost, we have former friends that are no longer friends because we would dare to question you know, their, their holy, sacred cow Christmas. And the, the thing is, and not just, you know, friends, family members, all sorts of stuff who basically deemed us, you know, total heretics because we would dare say a bad word about Christmas. But what they're actually doing and the attachment that they're giving, it's not a biblical one. It's an emotional one. It comes from an emotional state. So what they do is they look at the you know past times they had with friends and family. They, they you know, get all that, that warm, gooey feeling they get inside at that happy time of year. And that's what they're actually defending. And when we're talking about the biblical terms of what Christmas is and how the Bible actually condemns such acts from the heathens, the problem is, is that they're really defending their emotions. And they're, they're, you know, basically the representation of Christmas is their memories of their family, which they get emotional about and think that you're attacking their family memories, which is not what we're doing. We're saying what is, what is right and what is wrong by what God's Word standards tells us, not by what we feel. I agree. You know, we'll be going to a break soon, the first break. But before we do that, just to get off, to get away from my next question, first I want to ask you this. Just out of curiosity, before we go further, when did you yourself start to uh, question Christmas? I would assume probably as a child you celebrated it too. Am I right? Absolutely. So yeah. when did it start? Not... When did you start to feel, I guess the word I should use is convicted about it or feel it that, really you know, a few years ago, wrong. I would say, I'd say probably about uh, three or four years ago. Okay. I really did. I started to come to some conviction about it. I haven't, uh, look, as a, even as a born again Christian, I still did celebrate Christmas. And I'm not telling people that you're going to hell if you've ever celebrated Christmas. That's not what I'm saying. Uh-huh. There are tons of different wicked things that we do after we're born again that we have to learn about and then sanctify ourselves. So that, that's going to happen for a lot of people. They're going to have to go through that process. So it was just a few years ago. And then, you know, one of the years I finally actually, after I wrote this article, I had still gone to a uh, Christmas get together with a bunch of family, but I got up in front of everybody and I said, I asked for everybody's attention, and I spent five minutes explaining to them some of these things and asked them to go look it up. And after that, that one year, I have dedicated that I will not, I mean, I won't go to any kind of celebration or get-together where they've got these Christmas trees or for Christmas things. I just, the whole thing now, I mean, it's, it's so funny that, you know, like about four years ago, 
I was okay with it, but today, now that I understand the truth, it makes me sick to my stomach to even look at it. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of other Christians, at least in our church group, that have, have slowly gone through the same process and have gotten to the same point where now it's the, the things that we liked a few years ago are now sickening to us because we have an understanding of the truth. That's very interesting. Okay, Chris, well, let's go ahead and take our first break. Listeners, today, my guest is Christopher Johnson. He's the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, and we're discussing Christmas. Is it really a Christian holy? Day. We'll be back momentarily on the Truth Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the True Seekers radio show. Today, my guest is Christopher Johnson. He is the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism. Uh, What I forgot to say at the beginning is Chris and his wife started this ministry back in 2009. It's an evangelistic ministry in order to teach the truth of God's word and science. You can visit his website at www.creationliberty.com. And he was kind enough to give me some time today so that we could discuss Christmas. Is it really a Christian holy day? This is an important uh, subject in my mind. I've started to question it the last couple or so years. And so let's get back to the interview with Chris. So, Chris, can we start talking about the origin of Christmas? I believe in your article you say there is a connection to something called Saturnalia. Yes. Absolutely. And just like, you know, when we had discussed the Halloween uh, topic the last time we were on, uh, and it was, it was called Samhain, uh, the, this Christmas celebration is actually known as Yule. And I'll take you through, you know, how Yule got connected to Saturnalia and how Saturnalia, you know, all that was Christmas. So from a, uh, I'll just quote you this real quick from a book called The Christmas Compendium. It says, quote, on December, or on 17th December, each winter, ancient Rome would erupt into a wild party called Saturnalia that lasted seven days. It was in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture, whose name we get from, we get Saturday. This day in December was the winter solstice, and the belief was that this showed spring was drawing near, So and so the god of agriculture, the agriculture cultural growth needed to be honored, end quote. So that's that's where this uh, connection is really coming from. And this, what the if you talk to any kind of witches, because every now and again I'll run into somebody who is a pagan or a witch, and I can talk to them. If you run into somebody like that, ask them about it, and they'll tell you more about this. Uh, they What they celebrate is from the 17th to the 24th. is like a seven-day uh, festival called Yule, and right in between, right in the middle of it, is the winter solstice. It's supposed to be the shortest day of the year because it's supposed to be a representation that the sun god has died. You see, the sun god died during Samhain, Halloween, and now the sun god is being reborn during this time. That's why it marks the, the middle where the sun is at its, uh, where it's not showing for the, sh- or excuse me, it shows for the shortest time during the day, and then it starts, to, the days start to get longer. So it shows the sun slowly coming back, and this is what they believe. So from Scott uh, Cunningham has a book called uh, The Encyclopedia of Wicca in, Wicca in the Kitchen. This guy practiced elemental witchcraft for over 20 years. He's got over 50 books on the subject. He says, quote, Yule, that's December 21st, the winter solstice is a, is a solar ritual that has been preserved in the Christian observance of Christmas. This holiday astronomically marks the warning of winter. After the winter solstice, the hours of light increase each day. Therefore, Yule is associated with the returning the warmth of the sun, end quote. Uh, here's another one from a, a, a book called Wiccan Beliefs and, pa- and Practices with Rituals for uh, Solitaries and Covens. And this is, by the way, the guy that, that the author this book. He's a he's an engineer in the aerospace industry. He's, a, he's also a high priest of Wicca. You'd be surprised how many people in all different levels of society are actually witches. This says, quote, Yule is celebrated at the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Yule is the Celtic celebration of the goddess becoming the great mother, giving birth to the god who died at Samhain the previous year. And you see, that's exactly what I was referring to. This goes back and connects directly with Samhain. Samhain, Halloween, Christmas, Easter, these are all connected. It continues and says it is celebrated as the sun returns after the longest night of the year. In actuality, the holiday of Christmas has always been more pagan 
than Christian, which is why many early Christians did not recognize it, in quotes. So even the pagans can understand this. I mean, this, uh, that's why I'm giving you multiple references, and we have even more. I mean, that's why I encourage people to go and read the article about we have about Christmas on our website, because I won't be giving everything here today. There are many more references, and I give tons of these because I want people to understand that even the pagan unbelievers can understand this issue. And the question is, why can't Christians get this? Now, some people, uh, in addition to that, are going to say, well, wait a second, you're mentioning the 17th through the 24th, but we celebrate this, you know, Christmas on December 25th, so that doesn't really reference to it, does it? Well, let's take a look at this from a book called A Long Journey Home. I'm going to read this, uh, this quotation to you. It's a little long, but it's, it's worth it. It says, quote, Semiramis was the mother of and also became the first wife of Nimrod, king of Babylon. And keep that in mind, because we'll discuss that in just a second. And it, it continues, it says, by virtue of his being king, Nimrod was also believed to be a god. After Nimrod was killed, Semiramis, not willing to give up her power and position and, all, and already being with child, declared that Nimrod had gone to commune with the other gods, and she sequestered herself away from the public eye until after her son Tammuz was born. She presented him as Nimrod returned from heaven. Semiramis was hailed as mother of God and queen of heaven. By the way, that's what the Catholics call Mary. And it continues, it says, December 25th, Tammuz's birth Day, the day of his return was cause for great celebration, end quote there. So now if you go back into Genesis chapter 10, all right, some of these people are mentioned. In Genesis 10, uh, if you go through about verses 6 through 8, you'll see where Noah gave birth to Ham. Ham then brought forth Cush. Cush married Semiramis, and they had a child named Nimrod. And then Nimrod had a child with his mother named Tammuz. So Semiramis gave birth to her own grandson. And this is all wickedness and abomination in the sight of God. Okay. Now, Semiramis and Nimrod were the rulers over Babylon. Okay. And this is from a book called Behold a White Horse. Quote, Semiramis gave birth to another child named Tammuz by her son Nimrod. While claiming she was a virgin, she maintained that she was the reincarnation of Nimrod. This was the foundation of the virgin mother with child archetype that Satan used to corrupt the many world religions. Mary worship and the icon of the virgin with child is derived from the image of Semiramis and her baby Tammuz by Nimrod, end quote. So first of all, the 25th was marked as Tammuz's birthday, and this whole thing is going back to Babylonian sun god worship. That's where all this, all this really, uh, this, this archetype that was created, because you, you know, you see the, the virgin mother Mary with her child Jesus, supposedly, that's what they're giving a representation of. All the Catholic Church has done is change the names of them, mm -hmm. because originally all this was was Nimrod and Tammuz, which well, Nimrod slash Tammuz with Semiramis. That's what this was. And this is represented in many different pagan religions. And then what happened, and according to this is from a book called Weird and Wonderful Christmas, it says, quote, in 350, Pope Julius I officially declared December 25th as the birthday of Jesus. In 354, Bishop Liberius of Rome officially adopted December 25th as the day to celebrate the birth of Jesus, adding the holy day to the Roman calendar. In AD 400, Pope Sixtus III conducted the first midnight mass on Christmas at the church of Santa Maria uh, Migori in Rome, end quote. So it wasn't until 400 AD that it was even given the name Christmas, because before then it was known as Yule, and then when Rome adopted, they started adopting all the pagan religions from the nations that they were uh, overtaking. And so they called it Saturnalia and celebrated this for, uh, throughout the week. And then later, once the Roman Catholic Church starts up, they name it Christmas, and this is a pagan celebration that's been carried through for thousands, literally thousands of years. And so I'm not sure how much we have time we have left in this segment, but I want to get into just a little bit more of that about Babylon. Uh, okay. how much time we, we got, got about four minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Wonderful. Well, what, um, what I want to get to get people to understand here is first the Semiramis. So there's some people that will say, well, I've never even heard of Semiramis before, if, they're, if they have any questions about Christmas and don't know the history of it. Well, actually, you may have, because if you've ever heard of the Statue of Liberty, you've seen images of Semiramis, because that's one of the, and one of the symbols that's used as Semiramis, where it has her holding up a torch like that. The torch is supposed to be represent, representative, that she's supposed to be with child, uh, she's not showing, but she is with child, and she's holding up this torch for uh, Nimrod to come back to her. That's what that whole thing is. Or if you've ever watched a movie of uh, Columbia Pictures, their introduction mm -hmm. shows this woman dressed in a white robe, and she's got she's holding the torch of Semiramis up. That's what that's what all that means. And what people have to understand is that she's represented, at least depicted, as not being pregnant pregnant there, but she is conceived, waiting for him to come back. 
And so, it, so you have the uh, depiction of Semiramis holding the child Tammuz, and then there's another depiction, this right here, of Semiramis without child holding up the torch awaiting his return. People need to understand this is a symbol of Antichrist. And a lot of people don't, don't get that because they don't understand the connection between these things. But you see, this is a, the whole thing is supposed to be a representing this Messiah child come back from heaven who is a god, and this is a, a symbolism of Antichrist that they use. And a lot of people don't don't get that that's that's uh, posted everywhere. But that's uh, what those who understand it. I mean, there's no way they would not, they would have built the Statue of Liberty without the, the people who designed that, without the understanding of what that really represented. And so. What I want people, one of the main big points I want people to get, Babylon was located in a land called Sumer. That's why if you ever hear the Bible, or Babylonians refer to the Sumerians. Mm -hmm. That's the land that Babylon was, was uh, located in. And it was named uh, uh, after, well, it was named for the word Babel, to Babel. Um, and that's where we get that, excuse me, that's where we get that word from. Because when God separated the languages at the Tower of Babel, you have to understand in their position, I mean, you, you would be standing next to someone, and suddenly they're now speaking gibberish that seems to make no sense to you. And then everybody has to find each other who are speaking the same language that they are, whatever gibberish that they're speaking that can be understood. And then they separate into their groups, and they spread out around the world. Now, the one key thing that a lot of people miss is that they all, before all the languages were separated at Babylon, they were all worshiping the same god, because in Babylon, the, the rulers over Babylon were considered gods. They were all worshiping the same god, Semiramis, Tammuz, Nimrod, they were worshiping the same ones. When the languages were separated, once these languages got separated, they still worshiped the same god. And that's what I want to get across to people, that the... All, the only thing that changed were the names by which they called those gods. And that's why we seem to have this seemingly endless amount of gods and goddesses around the world. Not every single god or goddess in all mythology around the world comes from Babylon, but most of the main figures did. It's the ones that were, uh, it's, you know, there were lesser religions that were creating, you know, a bunch of der uh, derivatives of this. But in the main ones all around are all attributed to the same one. And if you talk to any kind of witch or pagan, someone who practices this stuff, now you don't have to walk up to every pagan that you see and say, repent, sir. You don't have to do that and approach them that way. You can always begin to talk to them. as it, Act like you're interviewing them. That would be a good way to go. Just just talk to them and ask them. Just like, you know, Angeline sits here and interviews me. You can do the same thing with them. And many of them are more than happy to talk to you about the religious ideas. They're not, they're not scared of it. And ask them about it. Ask them if the, all of the different gods and goddesses, if they all represent the same entity. And they will tell you that they do. They know that the same uh, energy in the universe, this rulership over it, is all attributed to many different names. They, they understand this very clearly. And the Nimrod Tammuz with Semiramis uh, representation is represented in many different cultures, like Adonis and Aphrodite from the Greeks, or the Egyptians with Osiris and Isis. And this is why you're going to see, if any of you have had any conversations with atheists, you're going to see why they consider Christians to be so ignorant. There's mm -hmm. a reason for this. Mm -hmm. Because they see, oh, wow, all these connections, see, these things came first, and then the Christians started adopting this stuff later. Well, first of all, that's not true, because what we have through, through God's Word is in itself alone is very unique. However, there were a lot of other stories and mythologies floating around out there, which the Catholic Church has copied. And when we copy the things the Catholic Church in Rome has done, we are making ourselves a part of this whole thing that's in the Bible called Mystery Babylon. That's why it refers to that. It's because all the mystery religions of the world started with Babylon. That's, that's the source of all this thing. And so, of everything that we're seeing today, at least, and all these different false pagan religions. Because if you can consider Allah from the, from the Muslims... Mm -hmm. That Allah is only one of 360 different pagan gods that were in in that uh, that Kabbalah place that uh, Muhammad came and he selected that one. Again, if you don't know much about that, you can uh, just type in the word Islam at creationliberty.com. We have a whole expose on that. You can read more about that and how that came to be. So many of the world's religions today are all based off that same paganism, and even uh, Peter in the Bible used the word... Babylon as a code word for Rome. That's what the Revelation's referring to as Mystery Babylon. So different names uh, for Semiramis. She's also known as Venus, Guan Yin, Aphrodite, Ceres, Shing Mu, Diana, Artemis, Astarte, Ishtar. Now, if those of you who think that sounds familiar, that's because that's where we get the word Easter from. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are all connected. Irene, Isis, Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth is mentioned three times in the Bible. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 11, you can go look that up. 
uh, and Mary in Catholicism. Now, the Mary that Catholics label is not the Mary of the Bible. That is Semiramis. That is Semiramis, the Babylonian goddess, but they have given her the name Mary. Mm-hmm. And then the Nimrod Tammuz, he's, uh, that is called uh, by Osiris, Horus, Jupiter, Saturn for the celebration of Saturnalia, Adonis, Orion, Demuzi, Bacchus, Apollo, Ra, Baal. Baal is another version of this. All the worshipers of Baal in the Bible and Jesus, in quotations, in Catholicism, because all they did was they took the Nimrod Tammuz symbol and they slapped the Jesus label on it and called it good. Okay, Chris. Well, that's interesting information. We're going to elaborate even more on that when we come back. Listeners, today my guest is Christopher Johnson. He's the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, and we're discussing Christmas. Is it really a Christian holy day? We'll be back momentarily on the Truth Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the Truth Seekers radio show today. My guest is Christopher Johnson. Again, you can read his article called Christmas, the Rejection of Jesus at www.creationliberty.com. So, Chris, just before we went to the break, um, this this next question ties right into that. So you say in your article that the reason that it's important for Christians to separate themselves from these pagan rooted celebrations like Halloween, Christmas, Easter, is because what it does is it gives the impression to the world that we are rooted, uh, that God's word is rooted or evolved from this Babylonian pagan worship, which you kind of alluded to before we went to the break. But then my question is, well, I agree with that, but if so many Christians are brainwashed into thinking this is all good and rooted in Christianity, how do we change the tide? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It seems like it's an overwhelming like tsunami wave that you can't stop. Right. Uh, well, all we can do is spread the seeds, just like Jesus did. There's, there's nothing else we can do. We can continue to tell the truth. And again, we're going to suffer afflictions because we tell that truth. We're going to have people hate us. They're going to get angry at us and do it, but you have to do it one person at a time, grassroots, just like Christ did. But even he explained in Matthew chapter 7 that even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire, which is where a lot of these Christmas trees ought to go, uh, in my opinion. So, but the, the thing is, the problem is, by your fruits you shall know them. And the problem is, you know, we cannot preach the proper gospel and doctrines of Jesus Christ while we're committing adultery. We can't teach the proper gospels and Jesus uh, doctrines of Jesus Christ if we are drinking alcohol while we're doing it. And we can't do it if we're also celebrating paganism at the same time, because Jesus Christ wanted us to be sanctified. When he prayed to God the Father, he said, I pray that thou should not take them out of the world. I mean, we're going to have to go through this stuff. I mean, I still, I still work a job, you know, as, uh, aside from most of the you know, mainstream apostate preachers out here. I actually have to work. So if I go out and work a job, and, uh, and then I have, you know, I have to see all this, all this paganism around, and it makes me sick to my stomach. But I, you know, I act among them as one of them. You know, I don't, I just don't participate in the same things that they're participating in. Jesus Christ wanted us to be a peculiar people, just like He wanted the Jews to be peculiar people. And we're not being peculiar if we're doing the same things the world is doing and yoking up with the world. Because he said, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. This is what he was praying to God the Father. He said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world, and, I, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. Jesus Christ sanctified himself from the pagan junk. And he says, and then he says that they also might be sanctified for, for, uh, through the truth. Jesus Christ did not yoke himself up with Rome, and we ought not to do the same thing. We need to be sanctified ourselves, and be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, as it says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter. So, Chris, in your article, you um, mentioned some pastoral arguments that pastors use to justify the paganism. What are some of these arguments that they use? <laughs> yeah, they, there are a number of them that they use. Uh as far as, I mean, and a lot of these are just ones that I have experienced from, from some of them making. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the first one that I've, I heard was uh, they'll say, well, we use pagan names like Sunday for days of the week, and there's nothing wrong with that, so therefore our Christmas celebration is justified. This is one of the ones I've heard. This is actually what's called, if you, if you were to enter into a logical debate where, with you know, laws of logic and things like that, it's what's called a conflation fallacy, or a lot of people just know it as comparing apples to oranges and calling them the same thing. Uh, if another type, like if, if I were to give a similar argument, they would say watermelons are green, cabbage is green, therefore watermelons and cabbage are both fruit. That's not logical, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what they're doing here. It's, it's true that the days of the week are labeled from pagan concepts, just as a Christmas tree is labeled from pagan concepts. But one needs to be questioned is the origin of the subject matter. So God created the days, which means the days have a good origin. And so according to the Bible, the days don't automatically become evil, just as trees themselves have a good origin, and trees are not evil. However, the pagan tradition of decorating the trees is evil, and that's talked about in Jeremiah chapter 10. In Jeremiah chapter 10, it says, and, and starting in verse 2, it says, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Now, the word heathen, a lot of people are unfamiliar with that. It means, it means pagan, a pagan or one who worships idols. So immediately God has told us, that the Lord has said, learn not the way of the heathen. And not only do we have a lot of people learning the ways of the heathen, but teaching others the way of the heathen. I mean, we have a lot of these churchgoers out here. I don't, I don't know if they're Christians or not, but a lot of churchgoers continually teaching on the way of the heathen, which they shouldn't be doing. And it says, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. Well, just as we talked about, all these different uh, observing times that they're doing, which Galatians chapter 4 says that we're not supposed to do, all they're doing is uh, doing this based on the, on the worship of the sun god, which is the positioning of the sun, which is they're looking to the signs of heaven and getting dismayed at these things. That's why the Bible talks about that they're weeping for Tammuz, the abominate, great abominations that they were doing, weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz is specifically mentioned in the Bible as well. This is for the heatheners dismayed at them. And in, in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. I don't know a better description of a Christmas tree than that right there. That's exactly what that is. And mm-hmm. God said that we're not even supposed to learn those ways, let alone do them in our homes. And so that's one of the arguments that they're trying to make here, saying that this origin, the origin of this tradition that they have, was somehow good when it is completely evil and completely not of God. So it's a, it's a fallacious argument they're making there. The second one that I've heard, and you know, like I said, these are just ones I've experienced, personal experience. You had people write me or tell me through messaging. And uh, one of them was that they'll say, well, I've heard some Jehovah's Witnesses say that Christmas is evil, and they're founded in theological error, so therefore Christmas celebration is justified. Again, this is what's called an association logical fallacy, okay? Or some people know it as guilt by association. So here's, here's a different type of argument to help understand what they're doing. They say Beth's favorite movie is Star Wars. Jeffrey Dahmer's favorite movie is Star Wars, and it was, by the way. Mm-hmm. Therefore, Beth and Jeffrey Dahmer are both murderers. Well, that, that's, not, <laughs> that's not logical. That's not the stuff that we take here to say that, okay? It's true that the Watchtower Society does not celebrate Christmas because of its pagan origin. But just because they sit in error about the salvation of Jesus Christ doesn't automatically mean that they are wrong about Christmas, okay? The Catholic Church teaches false doctrine on the salvation of Jesus Christ in the Mass, but when a Catholic stands up and says that God is the creator that created the world in six days, does it automatically mean he's wrong? No, okay? He, He might be right about that and simply wrong about other matters, okay? So it, it, you don't want to you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater there, and that's a fallacious argument that they're making. Okay, because this person over here does it, therefore I'm not going to do it. Well, that means Jehovah's Witnesses are becoming your final authority in all matters of faith and practice, and not the Word of God. We need to stick on the foundation of the Word of God and not let men be the decider of whether we, not, we, we make a decision on what's right or wrong. Men are not the decider of that. The Word of God is. Now, the third one that I list on here is that a pastor would say, well, I used to teach Christmas is wrong, but I was mean to people when I did. So anyone who preaches against Christmas is just being mean. I have literally read that, all right, mm-hmm. <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a pastor one time. This, I'm not just making this up. Uh, this is what's called a false dichotomy, or some people know it as a false dilemma. So an example of this type of argument, it says 50% of the class likes chocolate ice cream and the other 50% likes vanilla. Which side are you on? <laughs> well, there's more than two flavors of ice cream. It's not logical to assume there's just two options, and that's what he's doing. He says anybody, 
you're either on the side of Christmas or the good guys, or you're on the, or you're against Christmas, you're with the bad guys. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to turn it into a Dr. Seuss, who was an evolutionist, by the way, a Dr. Seuss type thing where you're just a Grinch if you dare you know, say anything about Christmas. Don't you dare teach us the truth about these things. Well, my Bible says, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. We're not rebuking so, you know, hey, I can be right. It's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about rebuking sharply to get people onto the truth so they can be sound in the faith. Well, Chris, we're, we're running out of time quickly. Let's go ahead and take the last break. And when we come back, we'll start to touch on some of the things that are related to Christmas and what might be wrong with them. You already talked about one of the biggest ones, which was the Christmas tree. So listeners, oh, yeah. uh, today my guest is Christopher Johnson from Creation Liberty Evangelism. We're discussing Christmas. Is it really a Christian holy day? And we'll be back momentarily on the True Seekers radio show. Welcome back. You're listening to the True Seekers Radio Show. Today, my guest is Christopher Johnson, the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism. And we're discussing his article called Christmas, the Rejection of Jesus. And you can find it at www.creationliberty.com. Also, he's got so many other articles on a variety of subjects. He's got a great website. So check it out again, creationliberty.com. So, Christopher, you touched on the Christmas tree because that was on my list for number one. So you've covered that one. Let's go to Santa Claus. What's the story behind this character? What's wrong with him? What is it about those eight reindeer? Well, the Santa Claus issue is kind of a long one. I know we aren't going to be able to cover everything uh, right here. But I'll start off reading this from a uh, book called The Wicked Craft, The Modern Witch's Book of Herbs, Magic, and Dreams. It says, quote, The modern personification of the Christmas spirit known as Santa Claus was at one time the pagan god of Yule. Uh, to the Scandinavians, he was known as uh, Christ on the Wheel, an ancient Norse title for the sun god who was reborn at the time of the winter solstice, end quote. So like last time we were talking about the, you know, the, the Halloween issue and how we talked about the pagan witch's wheel of the year where they have eight major celebrations. This is what they're talking about when they put, uh, you know, the Santa Claus character reborn at this per- certain point on the wheel. That's what that's referring to. And it's a Norse title for these things. The Santa Claus uh, can represent actually a number of different things, but there's a few main sources that it comes from. And I'll read you this from a book called The Encyclopedia of Wicca and Witchcraft. It says, quote, Holly King is a symbol of the waning forces of nature. And the Holly King is another name for that Santa Claus represent- representation. It continues and says, the Holly King is depicted as an old man in winter garb. His head bears a wreath of holly, and he often carries a staff that is typically a holy, a, a, or excuse me, a holly branch. Some Santa Claus figures are actually Holly King figures, in quote. So we have to understand also that the holly is a representation of, I mean, there's a lot of different things, the holly, the ivy, uh, all those things, which I know we didn't have, we're not going to really have time to discuss much today. Those are pagan symbols. And in fact, they are they are symbolism that helps people set up witchcraft altars in paganism. And so, a lot of that stuff that's that's a represent. These are different decorations that are put onto this Holly King representation. Uh, and we're going to see all these concepts uh, come together. And basically, well, let me read this to you. I'll, tell, I'll show you because, it, like I said, I apologize. I'm I'm going this way, but there's so many different directions this could go in. And this uh, book is called The Outer Temple of Witchcraft: Circle Spells and Rituals. It says, "Quote: You rule the winter solstice, a ritual theme." Now it's it's des- describing what this is all about. The ritual theme is rebirth of the sun god return of the old god to the underworld. Now, before I continue this quotation, that's the connection that's being made here, is when the, you know, the Catholic Pope were trying to bring all these pagan religions under one umbrella into the Catholic Church. And that, by the way, is what the Catholic Church has always been about, is bringing them all under one umbrella for the Pope to rule over all of them. And that's why a lot of people see the Pope as the seat of Antichrist. Nobody knows whether the Pope is actually going to come out of that or not, the Antichrist, or excuse me, the Antichrist come out of the Pope's seat or not, but he is in a prime position to make that happen. And so the rebirth of the sun god, when they see this ritual theme in this worship, they'll say, okay, well, the Christians say that Jesus Christ 
was born of a virgin here, and so this is like the, the rebirth of God here, and so they're going to connect those two together into the same, uh, same celebration. So it's all pagan religion supporting pagan religion. And then it continues and says the lunar con- correspondence is, is the dark of the moon, and by the way, that's something else that I, I really, we don't have time to make too much of a connection. The dark of the moon, that's a symbolism that's used in Catholic depictions of Mary. There are many depictions of her standing on the dark of the moon, because that's the lunar correspondence to this day. In fact, on, the, on our Catholic article in our website at creationliberty.com, you just type in the word Catholic, you can read all about that. We have pictures and we show people how that's, that's how they, that she is depicted in many of their paintings. And the deities are represented the solar child, the sun king, the great mother, and the underworld slash horned god, oak king, and holly king. So the holly king and the horned god are, d- are directly connected, these, these things. But I'll go ahead and end quote there because I, have to, I kind of have to pick and choose what we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the horned one, what is the horned one? Well, in, uh, this is from a book, uh, actually interesting, it says, When Someone You Love is Wiccan, A Guide to Witchcraft and Paganism for Concerned Friends. Now, of course, it's written by a witch, okay, that's trying to make it seem all, uh, uh, it's trying to lessen the uh, apost- or, excuse me, the heresy of witchcraft and the heresy of, of paganism. It's trying to lessen that in people's minds so they'll become more accepting of it. Um, and that's, what, that's the only reason I say that's interesting that they're, they're trying to do that. But this says, quote, some witches and other pagans refer to the masculine aspect of God as the horned god or the horned one. Uh, Therunos, the, the Celtic horned god, indeed his name means horned one, is depicted as the lord of the forest and, and the animals. In a similar way, the Greek god Pan is depicted as having horns and goat, goat-like legs and feet. And by the way, Pan is the, the same demonic uh, representation that's in uh, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, which, by the way, his entire book series is not Christian. That man himself is not a Christian, and that whole thing is all about paganism and his study into pagan pagan religions. And that uh, again, we have an article on our website called "Fantasy Novels: uh, Invitations to Hell." On our, you just type in the word "fantasy" at creationliberty.com, and you can read about that more too. But Pan is another uh, god, and that's the same god Pan that Aleister Crowley, the Satanist Aleister Crowley, worshipped. So it says, well, here, it continues, it says, like Serenos, Pan is seen as a god of nature and of wild beasts, end quote. So now we're already seeing a connection between Santa Claus and the satanic god that, that the Satanist Aleister Crowley worshipped is one of the same. Uh, here is the from the book, uh, again, the Outer Temple of Witchcraft, Circle Spells and Rituals. It says, quote, in some traditions, the god is viewed as a child, and the universal mother gives birth to the young sun king. You see how this all connects together with Simurinus and Tammuz. Mm-hmm. It continues, it says, others see, others see the god of light. And, and that's, that's also, by the way, I guess that brings to mind what all the Christmas lights are about and where that came from. I know we use electric Christmas lights today, but all that represents the candles they used to burn on the Yule log, which is where the origin of the Christmas tree, which, again, we haven't discussed today. But uh, this, that's where all that comes from. They used to light candles in the houses to invite people to come and join in the pagan celebration. All the Christmas lights that you're seeing out here, they might be pretty and they might be fun, but all they do is represent people coming in and to joining in the worship of the sun god, or the horned one, as we're talking about here. And this quote continues and says, Others see the god of light. It says, As the oak king rise up out of the underworld and combat the god of darkness, the horned god, or holly king, and take his place as ruler for half the year. End quote. So you have this oak king and this holly king that are supposed to be fighting against each other and taking up their position. And so this uh, holly king is supposed to take his position up on and, and become like, the, you know, the, the sun god that's supposed to bring, you know, bring back the sun, that kind of thing. So when people talk about, because there's a lot we could go into here, I'm trying, again, like I said, I'm trying to pick and choose, but this horned god is a satanic version uh, it basically is like Satan because the horn god is the god of darkness or the god of the underworld that's being talked about here. These things, I mean, the Santa Claus and this god are one of the same in this. That's why, you know, who is the god of the underworld or who's the ruler of the underworld according to Christian doctrine? Well, that's Satan. And that's why there's so many, I mean, when people are saying they refer to him as Satan Claus, this isn't just cute rhetoric. They're actually, mean, they're not trying to be funny. We literally mean that Satan is represented in the form of Santa Claus, okay? And Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 8, it says, For ye were sometimes in darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord, so walk as children of light. And it says in 
And it continues later and says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We're not supposed to be yoking ourselves up with this stuff. We're supposed to be reproving these things. It continues and says, For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things are reproved and are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Now, Angeline was right earlier. She's saying, you know, how hard is it to fight against this giant wave of people that seems to be overwhelming to try to get this tide turned back? And we may never do that because the tide is going to continue to flow. But we can save some. We can get the truth out to some. And the only, the only way the truth is going to get out is, are by those that are teaching the light of the Lord. They are teaching the, the, the truth of God's Word and exposing this paganism, which is what we're supposed to do. And so Santa Claus is really... Uh, is represented not only in this horn god, it's also represented as Odin, okay? And that's, that's another thing. We have to make the connection there, because that's where the eight, eight reindeer came from. I don't know how much time we have. Well, we're, we're just Can about we... out of time, Chris. But um, Okay. So if you just had to say somebody that's sitting on the fence, they're kind of, you know, torn, what would you say to them about Christmas? Well, I'd probably have to first, you know, quote to them, uh, I quote to him a number of scriptures, really, but, you mm-hmm. know, the Bible says, be not uniquely yoked together with unbelievers, because, you know, there's, Christ has nothing to do with Belial and with Satan and all these kind of things. The Bible says in Second Corinthians chapter 6, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That's in Second Corinthians chapter 6. But we... I mean, and even in Titus chapter 2, it says, "...who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee." Okay? So when God did all these things. He gave himself for us. Why? So he could redeem us from all iniquity and make us into a peculiar people. If you want to be a peculiar people, celebrating the same things the world does yoking up with the world and doing the same things the world does and all their flesh and all their materialism is not making you a peculiar people. If you want to be a peculiar people that has the opportunity to share the gospel, you need to you know, separate yourselves from those kind of things. Be able to bring stuff up. And, and a lot of people in conversation, you know, they're like, how do I bring that up in conversation? Well, when someone says Merry Christmas to you, they said, I'm sorry, I, I don't celebrate witchcraft. I don't celebrate <laughs> paganism. And that, that'll strike up a conversation it really quick because they're going to get awfully defensive on that. Thanks so much, Chris. We're out of time, listeners. Today, my guest has been Christopher Johnson, founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism. Check out his article called Christmas, The Rejection of Jesus on creationliberty.com. Until next week, this is Angeline saying goodbye on the Truth Seekers radio show. 